Hi, my name is Dwayne Gathers, and welcome to Civitas LA, featuring diverse and emerging leaders who make up this dynamic region and are creating community every day and building a better tomorrow. These bi-weekly conversations truly enable us to hear from, learn from, and be inspired by a new generation of civic entrepreneurs who are forging a path forward and making our region a stronger, more resilient, and connected group of citizens. Now more than ever, we aim to elevate civic discourse, foster community connections, and promote civic knowledge and engagement across our region while elevating diverse and emerging voices in that conversation. In a blog post that we referenced last year from the nonpartisan civic engagement group called Nonprofit Vote, which I believe is based in Cambridge, um, in talking about um, running for office, it it stated, encouraging people to vote is one of the most direct ways to protect and promote democracy, but running for office is probably the boldest. And certainly for the city of Los Angeles, 2022 is a critically important year with Angelinos being asked to decide who will lead this diverse and dynamic community over the next four, perhaps eight years. So as a podcast focused on elevating civic knowledge and engagement, and with the hope that these conversations will inspire folks to get involved, as we always say, Civitas LA is delighted to present this series, Leading LA, a conversation with, as we hear from those candidates making that bold step by seeking to lead this diverse city and be our next mayor. With that, we are excited to have in studio with us today, Craig Grivey, LA businessman. Craig, welcome to Civitas LA. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the work that you're doing in the dialogue in this city. It, there's there's not enough of that going on and it's it's so incredibly important. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Well, you know, we're just excited by this opportunity to play our small role in engaging our communities in this great civic conversation. So we appreciate you being here and sharing your voice to that conversation. On Civitas LA, we always appreciate it if our guests will offer a brief personal intro. Yes. So I, <laughs> my story is probably an unusual one and all too familiar to too many people in this country. I, you know, I didn't grow up in LA. I'm a nearly native Angelino, having been here 20 years, but I grew up in rural Indiana, as poor as you can possibly imagine, the type of poor where you got to tape the soles of your shoes to your feet, where you got to steal fish from the neighbor's pond in order to survive. Um, It was not a pleasant way to grow up. And then I was abandoned at the age of 14, uh, left to fend for myself. If I wanted food, I had to have a job and find it, right? So I had to... I did very early on make very tough decisions that no 14-year-old or, or, or any mm-hmm. age should have to make, what type to, type of job to get, how to survive, how to work full-time while going to high school, how to, what college was and how to even get there. Um, by a lot of hard work, a lot of blessings from other people, I ended up out here in L.A. at USC oh, wow. on a, a full scholarship, um, thankfully. Couldn't have been here otherwise. Um, in what is what was then the single cheapest apartment in university housing, like the actual single cheapest apartment in all of university <laughs> housing. Um, and, you know, from that point on, it became an exercise in both impossible choices. I was still on my own uh, until um, I was adopted by my parents as an adult. I was on my own from 14 to 24. But it was how to carve my way in the world, how to figure out what life was like, and then from that point on, it became how to do that for my clients, for businesses. Mm-hmm. I got my start mm-hmm. in the entertainment industry, but then ultimately mm-hmm. in business strategy, making seemingly impossible decisions for major corporations, um, often many times the size of Los Angeles, uh, mm-hmm. trying to find you know, solutions to seemingly impossible problems. And that became my career uh, and was for the last 20 years okay. um, until I stepped away to run for office. Yeah. So 20 years in Los Angeles. So before we get into the meat of our conversation, then let's get to know a little bit more about you through the lens of your Los Angeles in our lightning round questions. And this is an opportunity for us, to, for our listeners to discover more about you, but also to discover a few hot spots around town that they may not, may not otherwise know about. So are you ready for this? This is probably the hardest part of the conversation. I'm ready for this. It's hard for me because I have so many things that I love about LA. So I've got to like narrow it into a okay. lightning component. You, this, is, this is lightning round. Lightning. Yeah. Favorite restaurant or two? Okay. Uh, Rayao's, because I love the classic vibe of the whole okay. business. I love sitting at the bar and having okay. Orchette uh, and Vernetti on Larchmont, because I love being able to walk to a favorite Italian restaurant. Excellent. Give us a favorite place to take a sip, whether it's a watering hole or a coffee spot. Oh, nothing ever beats the Sunset Tower Hotel, just for the yes. the, the, the vibe, the view, the just the atmosphere, the history. Amazing. 
and the most amazing pigs in a blanket. Oh, is yes. It, and <laughs> ice cream sundaes. Yeah. I will order the ice cream sundae every single time. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Give us a favorite place to take a visitor. Oh, when people come here, I actually have a very unusual um, place to take a visitor. I created an architecture tour oh, wow. of LA on my own. Okay. So I take them to different spots on my little architecture tour because I'm obsessed with the the, the gems of architecture across Give LA. us a few spots on that tour. Oh, the cathedral downtown. Mm-hmm. Um, the, there's a whole community in um, of different craftsman homes. Um, okay, okay. There's Angel Square uh, where they they took Victorian homes off of Bunker Hill and put mm-hmm. them in, uh, in that historic community off the 110. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of different things yeah. like that. And you must enjoy being here on the campus of Emerson College, which is an architectural gem oh, itself. Beautiful Emerson yeah. College, RFK Arts High School, yeah. all of those amazing yeah. places. Give us a hidden gem, someplace yeah. someone knows and doesn't know. You know, I think. My hidden gem is a place that everybody knows, but nobody has ever, nobody ever goes to, um, and it's where I always start my architecture tours with with friends who visit, which is the Watts Towers. Oh, really? Okay. I think we all know that they exist, but yeah. I they mm-hmm. remind me of so much that is amazing mm-hmm. about LA. Open space is 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 hugely important. We just love getting outdoors on a sunny day. Give us a favorite park or hike. Angeles Point, overlooking downtown um, in Elysian Park, right? Just the, okay. the, that beautiful, stunning, incredible view mm-hmm. of the city from the east to all the way to the ocean. Okay. Getting together as a community is so important as well. Give us a favorite community event or activity for you. I have two. I choose one close to home since I live in Hancock Park, which is the the Larchmont fair that they do every October, the family fair there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, the other is I have built up a close relationship with a, a, an artist and activist named Hala who runs a group called Tough Crowd Ent- Entertainment out of South LA. And they do these incredible community-driven shows um, that are just music and poetry and all mm-hmm. kinds of just incredible storytelling every couple of months. And I try never to miss a show. Mm-hmm. I, they they are my wonderful. favorite thing. That's great. That's some wonderful favorites. So as as a podcast that's focused on elevating civic knowledge and engagement, you know, we're really thrilled to participate and have this particular series. And we'd like to start up asking our guests, what does civic engagement mean to you? Civic engagement to me means not just awareness, although at this point I would settle for awareness okay. <laughs> in Los Angeles given where we are. Yeah. Not just awareness, but always just one step further. What's the next step? Just one tiny step. Awareness and action. What is that action that you took? Mm-hmm. Um, I, if we could get everybody to take just one step, I think we would have a dynamic, engaging, and because that one step is addictive. Once you take that one step, there's the next one. Yeah. To me, civic engagement is just what, what's your, that next step mm-hmm. beyond awareness. Mm-hmm. And share with us your own civic engagement journey. How did you become involved in community? What compelled you? What got you motivated? Oh, heavens, yes. I have always lived with a sense of empathy given how I grew up. Um, And my focus has been always on how do I leave the world a better place. I literally lie awake at night trying to think about how to leave the world a better place, which is something I'm told is not normal. Um, But I have always been involved in different national charities, sitting on the board of the American Dance Movement. But looking locally... Uh, in 2018, I looked around like many Angelinos, thinking something feels off here, and I, I can I got I got to do something. I got to I got to I got to double down on whatever I'm doing. Uh, and so I started looking, treating L- LA almost like it were a client. What's the impossible question mm-hmm. here? What's really going on? We have thousands of nonprofits, tens of thousands of people involved in those nonprofits, but it doesn't feel like we're making enough progress. Mm-hmm. Um, it feels like some things are spiraling out of control, and so. It really started by asking that question of saying, I need to do something more because I feel challenged by the the state of the city. And that started a research and investigation process of 2,000 interviews and meetings and um, 200,000 pages of research that led me on this journey that I never intended to go on. Mm -hmm. I never was the kid who grew up saying, I want to run for elected office someday. That was not me. I always Mm -hmm. wanted to give back, but always from the private sector. So it really started with, with really looking and feeling these problems locally, seeing the looks in my friends and my family's eyes as they, they saw 
L.A. hurting and thinking, I got to do something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what it, 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 that's what got you on your civic journey. <clears throat> but obviously, you know, obviously what decided what led you to decide to actually run for office and particularly this office? <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Now that I'm running for office, I can I can say um, <laughs> we have created a system where no one should ever want to run for office. This is like it is a challenging system. Mm -hmm. um, I built, and this is your first run for any office. Yes, yeah. I had been approached several times since over the over the years in different respects to run for offices, and it was always a resounding no. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. I am mm -hmm. best of service in the private sector, uh, and. Then over the course of 2021, I started a nonprofit called Rise Together, which became one of the fastest growing nonprofits in the city, focused on common ground and common sense and, and changing the narrative, helping people feel like they weren't alone, mm -hmm. really just helping connect that narrative for everybody that we all have common ground. If we build from common ground, if we focus on what we share rather than what divides us, we can move forward. And we saw that there were candidates who represented that philosophy across the spectrum, across the city, who self-identified as um, friends of that movement. Um, and I became increasingly concerned from my perspective that we needed bold, decisive leadership in the mayor's office to match what was happening across the rest of the city. And in my personal capacity, I felt disappointed and challenged by my options. Um, and uh, and a lot of people in the movement felt that way. And a lot of people kept coming up to me saying, you should run, you should run, you should run. And I said, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, you've built an entire movement predicated on listening to people. And you're not listening to the people of the movement that you've built. So uh, I said, fair point. I w I, if I'm going to do this, I want to do two things. I want to make sure that we have a clear, hard, everything I've ever done in my life has been hard, a hard but clear path to victory. And I want to make sure that I actually have all of the answers that, I, that I'm going to present to the public. I, I want to start by saying, here are all of my plans in detail. Here's what we're going to do. I want to do the dignity of the public. And if I can't do those two things, then I'm not going to run. But we, we, we did. We, had, we devised and saw a very clear path to victory. And when I declared my campaign, I was the only candidate to declare with published, written, vetted plans in homelessness, affordability, crime, and corruption. And, and, and ultimately, it became a decision to represent the philosophy that I wanted to see in our city and, and didn't see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that that's that that's that's a great segue because um, you know with this series we've got obviously you know men and women who are are in in um, elected positions already and have had and have served for many years in different capacities. Um, so we always ask you know as a community leader or elected official you know what public policy areas most animate you? What are, what are you most excited about? Um, problems to tackle and any achievements in your in your community leadership that you want to point to. Yeah, I love engaging the people of this city. I talk to other candidates who, who talk about um, how exhausting a run for office can be. I'll tell you, I will spend all day long talking to people and engaging okay. with people, having done now um, over 200 town halls and events, um, meeting with people. And that animates me hearing uh, from them, hearing and seeing the inspiration and the hope in their eyes when we talk about what this city can be. We spend so much time talking about the challenges that this city faces. But if we frame those challenges in what we can do to eliminate them and what this city can be as a result, Mm -hmm. That gets me animated. Um, I really, I mean, my personal obsession is with the, like the, not just the crises we face that everybody talks about, homelessness and right. affordability and that sort of thing. It's uh, the pipes under the city. Um, really, I, most people don't realize this, that 90% of the pipes under the city are over 80 years old and made of ceramic mm -hmm. clay, um, which is a ticking time bomb, right? Like in an earthquake, mm -hmm. we have ceramic clay breaks right. and water stops flowing to the city. So it really animates me because it literally is yeah. the single most important, like there will be no Los Angeles if we don't fix this problem, right? right? Like right. we can struggle along in homelessness, but we have to fix the pipes under the city. Well, I, I it, it, hark <laughs> it harkens back to a conversation we had last year. I want to say episode 27 with the former president of the Board of Public Works um, Commission, Kevin James, who, mm -hmm. who was great conversation we were saying that public works is the sexiest part of local government. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yes. Gotta um, fix the pipes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, you know, from achievements, it, I'm proud to have, even though I've never 
held elected office. I'm proud to have had achievements that have helped restructure some of America's most trusted corporations, but that also have had a direct impact on the people of this city and the people of cities across the country. You know, in the pandemic is a good example. I designed a program where everybody was talking about, well, how do we help? And Google was saying, let's do ad credits for small businesses and things like that. And my response was, what do small businesses need? How do we give that to them directly? They, they, they don't know how to use the ad credits. They don't know how to use these other things. How do we help? And so we created a program called Feeding the Front Lines, um, and then that later expanded into small into Comeback Coach, um, where we saved thousands of small businesses and fed uh, frontline essential workers, and we did it very simply. It was, okay, let's order food and deliver food. Okay. This is direct assistance. What do restaurants know how to do best? Make food for people. Right. What are people not doing enough of? Ordering food. Great. So let's order tens of thousands of meals and give them to people. Mm -hmm. And we were solving two problems at once. Direct assistance to people who needed feeding and helping businesses do what they do best. And we saved thousands of businesses in that way and, and, and ultimately built it into a program called Comeback Coach, which helped a lot of businesses mm -hmm. recover from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, you know, you know, we've got a very diverse community here. And, you know, everyone is complaining about the, the problems. Um, but, you know, give me some thoughts on, you know, how you've worked with diverse communities to address common challenges and achieve successful outcomes. I think my work with Rise Together is probably the best example of that. You know, mm -hmm. we started with the fact that no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what community you have, your, every community has their own particular needs, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in every geographic region, every background, every income level. But we all share one thing in common, which is the, the, this increasing feeling that this city can and needs to work for its people. Um, and so the idea was, how do we build from that common ground across each of those communities? And I'm proud to say that in under nine months, we built a community of over 100,000 members with representatives from every aspect mm -hmm. of, of every community in Los Angeles, from South, East, West, and North mm -hmm. LA, mm -hmm. all the way from the, the San Fernando Valley down to Harbor. And the reality was we were able to engage each of those communities by focusing on the threads that they shared and the thread that they all shared as an Angelino in how challenged they were by this city. Mm -hmm. Now, communities disproportionately suffer, particularly our most marginalized communities, communities of color. But it's those are degrees of suffering, but it's all the same problem, which is that the city isn't working uh, enough, isn't doing mm -hmm. enough for the people who live here. Yeah. And threading that needle, building that movement, and then shifting perspective. When we started Rise Together, according to a study that we did, 75% of Angelinos believed no matter what they did, nothing was going to change. Right. Within nine months, that number had dropped to 38%. We, we were building a movement, putting gasoline on the spark of a belief and an optimism that things could be changed. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly getting folks aware and engaged and now, you know, to vote is always a challenge in Los Angeles. And as you know, L.A. has in the past at least witnessed very low municipal voter participation rates. Um what are your views on that? Does it concern you? And how do we get that number up? It does concern me, right? When uh, it doesn't matter how you feel about your elected leadership, when, you know, in a city of nearly 4 million people with a voter pool of 2.1 million, a mayor is elected with 220,000 votes, it's not good. Right, right. right. That's not a good thing. Shocking. Um, the date change in elections will go a long way towards that, aligning with federal elections. The system of March elections was built to control the outcome of the vote. It was built to suppress the vote. So shifting to when people are normally used to voting, mm -hmm. aligning with a bigger election will do a lot towards that. But the reality is people vote when they believe that their vote matters. Number one reason in studies show that people don't vote is they don't believe that their vote matters. We have got to show them that their vote matters. We have got, the burden is on those of us running for office and civic institutions and, and, uh, and organizations and podcasts and everybody else to show that your vote matters. This is the most consequential election in Los Angeles in perhaps the last half century. And showing people that, putting the burden on us to educate the public is how we drive that vote up. We cannot expect people to, who are pulled in a million different directions, who are running from their job to home to their kids to school, and, and now even just now we're still mentally suffering from and emotionally and, and financially suffering the pandemic. We cannot expect people to stop in that merry-go-round of chaos to say, 
oh, by the way, let me take a second. Let me take a second to figure out what, how to vote. We have got to reach them. We have got to meet them where they are. And I think that's what we don't do enough of in Los Angeles. And that's what we can do more of is put the burden on public and civic institutions to educate and engage the public mm -hmm. rather than in insist that we we expect the public to come to us. Sure. And certainly while, while voting is, is so important and it's one, one element of, of civic engagement, one that we care deeply about here at Civitas LA is also volunteerism and just getting people involved in the civic life of their communities and the city at large. Uh, mm -hmm. A few years ago, you know, one report that we found that, you know, really captured my attention was that the Corporation for National and Community Service based in D.C. had found that L.A. had the lowest number of those surveys with volunteer hours per resident, um, with just under 20 percent of residents in the L.A. Long Beach area volunteering, which ranked L.A. 46th out of 51 areas. And I think California as a state only ranked 48th out of 50 states in the District of Columbia. So, you know, you know, in terms of leading LA, how might you hope to spur more civic engagement and volunteerism if you're chosen to lead? I think if we want people to volunteer, we have got to empower them to do so. In a city where 70% of people, according to a McKinsey study, have to struggle to make the rent, meaning on any given month they're choosing between rent and food, rent and gas, and what, how can we possibly expect them to take an hour out of their day when that hour is an hour that they need to earn money just to survive. We've made this city so unaffordable to live in by empowering you. We've got to create the space for volunteering along with the attitude of volunteering, right? People are stretched thin in this city by creating the opportunity for people to struggle less and to support each other more. I think that's one aspect. And by threading communities, it's often said that, uh, you know, LA is, is whatever it is, 92, 88 suburbs in, in search of a city. Right. Um, We've got to thread communities. We've got to build opportunities for people from different communities to meet and engage with each other and build relationships. How many people do you know who in the middle of the pandemic said uh, the most that they saw of their neighbors was when everybody was out walking around right, five and six o'clock right, around sunset? Right. We don't create those opportunities. We build festivals and, and opportunities that cater to individual communities, but we don't thread between communities. We don't build relationships. How many people from the Orthodox Jewish community are engaging with uh, South LA on any daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. And how is the city taking the burden on for creating those threads? Mm -hmm. That is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. The city's responsibility is to its people, not the other way around, yeah. right? And if we want people to participate, then we've got we've to create create time and energy and space for them to participate emotionally, physically, and financially. Mm -hmm. And then we've got to create opportunities that are engaging, that take them out of their circle to meet and experience new things and work with other communities. And 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 do you have any initial thoughts on how you might go about doing that? Were you the mayor of the city of Los Angeles? I am a big fan of the idea that government can often get in the way and we need to do more to give people the opportunity to do the things that they do best. And so in my administration, within the first 60 days, I want to convene hundreds of working groups across the city for every community from uh, the trans community to South LA to Orthodox Jews. And I want to empower each of them to decide who's representing their communities holistically, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we obviously want to make sure that they're diverse, and that, but they represent their community mm -hmm. and empower them to come back with a, a report of what can we do to build relationships, to build engagement? What does your community need the most? Now, we do too much of commission making in this city. That's not what this is, because the second part of this is something that we've never done before in Los Angeles, which is that every single one of those working groups will have a budget to execute their plans, okay. right? It's not about government saying, well, let's put this up to a city council vote and then a second vote and create a whole new department. It's decentralized engagement by the people, of the people, for the people, financed with the people's dollars, right? Okay. If these people have paid so much in tax money, let's give them money to do the very things that they need done. If we're going to ask a community, what do you need most? Right, a community who struggles, a community that's suffering um, from some affliction, right? Why do we ask them and then we take that information into government? Instead, we should ask them and then empower them to act on it with government dollars. And okay. so that's what I'll do in the first 60 days. Certainly a different approach. 
Well, you know, Craig, thank you for being here. This has been a, a great conversation and really an honor for Civitas LA. And I just hope that a, a lot of people hear this entire series. We're certainly excited to learn more about you, your own civic journey, and explore the opportunity to elevate civic knowledge and engagement um, through your work with Rise LA. <clears throat> And we hope this will spur a grassroots involvement uh, across our city. But as we say on Civitas LA, the guest gets the final word. So share any concluding thoughts um, and especially touch on, you know, how you hope your leadership may make a difference in the lives of our diverse communities over the next four years or eight years, perhaps. Yeah, it. we can often feel overwhelmed, and we do, by the crises that this city faces. That is understandable, Um, whether it's financial, economic, security, public safety, homelessness, we can feel overwhelmed. But I want people to realize that we can take that feeling and we can channel that into the fact that this city can and should be the greatest city in America. And I don't say that lightly because I'm a, a, an Angelino booster. I say that because I've done the methodical calculation of the fact that mm-hmm. economically, financially, we don't face any of the limitations that other cities do. We don't, geographic, we have all of the resources to be the model American 21st century city. A city that is multi-ethnic, multi-economic level, multilingual, that is diverse in every way that you can possibly imagine where everyone rises together and that hope that inspiration is what drives me and that's what I think that people will see under my administration is a relentless sense of practical optimism I will never give up I will never give in there is an opportunity where we've seen in the past where people said well we we're we're getting there we're making progress or this is complex There is no stopping halfway. There is no settling for second best. If we are walking down our streets, I was walking down Highland the other day and I thought to myself, wow, this is, this is what we've, we've said, okay, we're just going to settle for this and try to make do around this. No, we can and should expect the most from our city. We should, we should expect it from every leader from every department, from every neighbor, we should expect the most from our city. And under my administration, I will work relentlessly every day to ensure that this city delivers the most, results-oriented delivery of the most. What do you need? If the city's not providing it, how do we do that? Because that is what our sole function is in government, Mm -hmm. is providing for the people of this city, empowering the people of this city, and helping everyone see the opportunity that Mm -hmm. is Los Angeles, to be the shining beacon on a hill for all of this country. Craig, that was that was terrific. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you being on here. Um, this has really been a great dialogue, and I appreciate your time. We all appreciate your service to community. For our listeners, to learn more about Craig Grivey, please visit www.craigformayor.com. And thank you all for joining us today. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this program, and we hope you'll join us for this ongoing series of conversations on civic engagement and civic leadership with those candidates who hope to lead this community over the next, or perhaps, eight years. As we say on Civitas LA, until we meet again, stay strong and get involved. To learn more about Civitas LA and to share feedback on this program or recommend a future program, please visit us at www.civitasla.com. And don't forget to connect with us on Facebook at Civitas LA, on Instagram at Civitas underscore LA, and on Twitter at Civitas underscore LA.